One of the important things we've been doing over the longer term to support Australian small and medium businesses is publish economic reports. And it's important for people to know where small businesses are going in the economy because they're making decisions often that have impact on your businesses. We've got copies of the Census Business Index, our last economic report for March. Those are available at the front uh, counter on your way out. Uh, you'll be able to take a copy. All of our reports are also available online as well. Shortly we'll have a few extra reports out that I'll be talking about at the end on social media and also technology. We've been doing technology reports since 1995. Uh, we didn't call it the e-commerce report then because there wasn't really e-commerce happening back in 1995. We were just getting computers and attaching them to the internet and doing that sort of stuff. But then it was called the technology report. And over that time I've seen small businesses and medium businesses really embrace technology. Um, but also now consumers are very strongly embracing technology and I'll talk about those trends too. What I've seen in recent times is really fascinating to see uh, Carol's presentation on, on the local economic conditions and a lot of it mirrors what we've been seeing nationally and also within New South Wales and at the regional level. We've seen confidence moderating for small and medium businesses. And you can see how this tracks in terms of the actual GDP data that you've heard a lot about. One of the important things why I am passionate about small businesses is that if you opened a newspaper on any given day, you'd probably be forgiven to thinking that in Australia there's a handful of large businesses, possibly in the mining sector, and that's pretty much it. But actually, most businesses are small. Over 96% of the business population are small businesses. Almost all the rest are medium. It's a handful of large businesses at the end, but you can see that the, the bulk of the reporting is on those larger businesses. So I'm going to give a bit of a snapshot on how small businesses are doing. You can see that confidence level, it's moderating, remaining well below the long-term average uh, really quite significantly. When you look at Australia's GDP, you can see also that that has been showing significant downward trends, and that's been quite a, con uh, a lot of national debate. Uh, at the moment on that and feeding into a whole range of decisions from interest rate settings through to the, the national budget. I'm going to talk a little bit about the global environment too because it's important even if we're not maybe feeling that closely connected to what might be happening in Greece to realise that some of it does impact on our businesses and to know which bits impact on our businesses. Certainly the United States, we've been seeing some uh, good signs of growth compared to what we were seeing a few years ago. We are seeing most of the indicators start in, in a sort of slow but almost sustained way, turn around and starting to see a bit of growth. One of the most difficult conditions that we're seeing in the United States still and a lot of jumpiness is around some of the building figures and some of the construction figures. Overall, the longer trend is, is upwards. Um, but that is a difficult market and there's still a lot of the deleveraging process working itself out. And at the, the federal level in the United States, that's still a major policy concern as to how they stabilise that and continue to help that working through the, the whole process of deleveraging and basically getting the housing market back to where it should be. And so that is going to take a long time. It has taken a long time for the United States to get to this point where we're seeing uh, small but sustained upward movements in most of the trends. And it's quite a contradiction when you look at what is now happening in Europe. And um, what we would have said last week on Europe is different from what we'll say today and it'll probably be different tomorrow and in the following weeks. But certainly when you look at the European situation and the Greek situation at the moment, um, the monetary union of uh, the EU is really very fragile. And it'll be fairly unlikely for that to continue uh, to have the same number of members, certainly at the end of this year as we see now. And, and it really highlights the impact of something we see domestically too in terms of our exchange rates. In Australia we have one currency and, and, and even that is difficult in a country of this size to then match conditions between different parts of the economy. And you can see how then this materialises in an economy such as Greece uh, where we don't, we've taken away um, that basically uh, mechanism that helps economies adjust the exchange rate. And if the exchange rate isn't there to help an economy adjust, then economies have to look to things like input costs and decreasing input costs. And this is why we're seeing 
very difficult unemployment situations in most European economies and why we're seeing all the um, difficulty from a political context and the political context uh, combined with the economic context is what is going to set that scene going forward. When we look at that, if we don't have the exchange rate to, to fluctuate and, and to help soften those sorts of situations, the decrease in, that's necessary in terms of input costs, that is basically labour costs when you come down to a lot of it, uh, it's meaning that the political context will probably say no at that stage. And this is what we've seen happen politically in Greece. So very much, as they said today, it, it is a referendum, the next elections that we'll see there, on whether or not they stay in the monetary union there. And, and so that will be very interesting to see how that goes. And a lot of that will determine then what happens uh, in the European context. Even if we're not directly linked with Europe in our own businesses, um, the confidence that that will have uh, will be quite an impact as well. In terms of China, we've also seen decreases in terms of some of the economic fundamentals there, but in a way that many are referring to as a soft landing. Uh, there was a lot of speculation that we see much stronger declines in many of those indicators. For Australia, that's good news that we're not seeing the rapid declines that some people were forecasting, but more a softening in economic conditions, which was expected at this stage. So that's very much good news from our perspective. Touching on the federal budget uh, that was just announced, a look at some of the main macroeconomic environment, key budget assumptions that go in there. Also, a bit of a look at the savings and spending measures that impact specifically on businesses as well, and the impacts on small business. But if you look at the forecasts in the budget, one thing you will notice compared to last year is that they have been revised down markedly. Uh, the top level GDP numbers, which used to have fours in there now, are turning into threes. We are seeing a weaker uh, demand environment. And, and that was really seen at the top level in the Reserve Bank statement, not this time, but the time before, when they were saying, we, we are st starting to see, they were noticing for the first time, apparently, uh, decreased demand, and, and this is the whole debate on whether they would reduce interest rates there at that point. And they held off for an extra month to see uh, the inflationary data. I'll come to that a bit later. Some of the key assumptions in the budget, uh, deficit this year, $44.4 billion. Um, in, in business terms, we'd say that they'd missed the target a bit by $21.8 billion. Now, what's $21.8 billion between friends, so? Um, we're forecasting a surplus at the federal level of 1.5 billion. You can see that's very small. Not much room for much of a miss on that one. And it's been revised down already uh, and depends on a one-year turnaround of $46 billion. You can see here, this was last year's budget situation. The red line is where they were planning to be. That's what's likely to end up happening. Uh, it's, it's deteriorated quite significantly, as you can see. And um, it requires then to get to that surplus of $46 billion turnaround almost. The biggest turnaround we've had in, in sort of modern times since it's been measured uh, was just over $9 billion. So there's a really big call to make that. There's not really any room for things to not quite work out there. No room for slippage at all. So you can see from this chart how they're intending to actually get to that. And the red line is payments. The blue line is the money that they're getting in the door. The red, money's the money go red line's the money going out. And basically, trying to move those payments from this sort of trajectory in one year to this trajectory. It means a big cut in expenditure. And it's going to be a really tough call. You can see here how the, the situation has deteriorated from last year. And um, you can see how the change in profile from our underlying um, budgetary balance is looking. So it really has changed quite significantly. And that perhaps gives you some context in terms of orders of magnitude uh, that we're seeing there. Obviously, cuts of that level are, are pretty hard to do. Uh, $5.4 billion in savings in defence is the largest one. But the second largest one is $4.7 billion, which has come from not going ahead with the company tax rate. So it's one of the largest budgetary measures uh, that, and, and particularly impacting on business. For small businesses, that was meant to come in for small companies from next financial year. 
And that's something that businesses won't be seeing. Also, pushing uh, back some of those foreign aid commitments, the standard deduction, uh, which hasn't been talked about too much, that's being cut or not going ahead with. Uh, and that, you might recall, in a previous budget was announced that we wouldn't have to keep receipts. You get a standard deduction of $500 initially, $1,000 the year after that. Uh, that's going to cost a bit too much, so you'll have to keep your receipts, is, uh, is the thing coming out of that one. Also changes to the living away from home allowance. The big, there's still expenditure uh, increases in some areas. The big one you've probably heard about is the school kids bonus. Now that's quite important for businesses. I'll talk a bit about that later. The NDIS uh, starting that, the loss carryback scheme, also important for businesses. And infrastructure, there's still quite a bit of infrastructure spending that doesn't actually come off the budget bottom line. It's funded elsewhere. Now the decision not to proceed with the company tax cut, that actually, uh, that's going to um, cut businesses $316 million next, in the next year. Uh, instead, they'll be getting ability to access loss carryback provisions. That's worth about six million. So obviously, there's about a 300 plus million dollar gap there. Um, nonetheless, uh, loss carryback provisions may be helpful for some businesses if they're in the circumstance that they're making a loss and doing it tough this year. You may be able to access previous profits for companies uh, up to a level of a million dollars, depending exactly. Uh, there are some complexities in that involving franking credits and such. So it's certainly something, though, to look into uh, with your accountant if your business is in that circumstance. Um, also, this year, announced in previous budgets, asset write-offs uh, are happening, bringing those forward so they don't have to be depreciated over the longer term. For businesses that are in the position of being able to spend money on capital expenditure, that's a saving there. And also, there's a few smaller costing items in terms of uh, the Small Business Advisory Service the support line uh, also being continued, and the announcement of new Small Business Commissioner, which is expected probably to, to be um, finalised in the new financial year. Certainly, though, we're seeing business confidence in this downward trend. You can see here, really, we haven't seen uh, terribly much positive movement for some time, and we're just in the field with our latest survey at the moment, uh, which will be re released in early June. You can see those um, views on the economy, the yellow and blue lines. The yellow line is the future uh, economic conditions expected in about a year. And also views on the federal government um, are all tending to have that downward spiral at the moment. But one thing we hear a bit about is the two-speed economy. I keep hearing about that all the time. Hands up anyone in the room that can remember the one-speed economy. Mm, not a lot of hands. I can never remember a one-speed economy. There's never been a one-speed economy. For businesses, as you know, doing business will vary over different time periods. It depends on the sector you're in. It depends on where you're doing business. And there's not really just one simple thing here. It's a whole spectrum. There's not one speed, there's not two speeds, it's not even three. Different businesses, individual businesses, you need to think where on the spectrum you are in terms of your business. Don't sort of lock yourself into the thinking that there's only two speeds out there, or three, or a bit of a patchwork type thing. It all depends on your individual business. Now businesses, even if the rest of your sector might not be doing well, there's still opportunities for your business for growing, depending on how you structure it. So don't get locked into some of the, the talk we hear a lot about there's only two speeds going in the economy at the moment. You can see last quarter we saw uh, business confidence vary from 3% in Adelaide up to 42% in Melbourne. And there's businesses everywhere along that spectrum, pretty much. You can see where all the main locations uh, really stand out there. But certainly, it, it, sometimes our thinking can constrain where we plan for our business if we try and lock ourselves into that two-speed model. Now, the reasons for falling SME confidence at the moment, what businesses are telling us directly is the number one thing, people not spending at the moment. There's a chart similar to what Carol had up earlier. In terms of household savings ratio, there's certainly a, a large element of truth in that. We've seen household savings go from basically zero at the time of the GFC, even negative. You know, we were pretty good at spending pretty much everything that came in the door. Um, so some quarters it was even negative. And it went up to 10% and above, even up to about 14% at the GFC. We've seen that ease back slightly to nine, but no one's expecting that to drop back quickly. It really reflects the conservatism in terms of spending on, both on the part of consumers and businesses as well. Uh, 
One of the interesting things about this chart is it didn't actually happen just at the start of the GFC. It actually started happening back just before the GFC, our spending rates started, but, but at the time people missed it because it, it just looked like a bit of statistical noise. When we go back now we can see actually we were sort of rethinking some of our spending and savings habits and getting a bit unsure about things even before the GFC started to impact. It's certainly a trend that's going to be with us for some time. It's not going to go over away, away overnight. People aren't going to suddenly start spending. So it's important when you're planning for your business to plan in that context that people are very hesitant to spend, and businesses also are hesitant to spend at the moment. Consumption, we saw last year fairly strong growth actually in household consumption. We've certainly seen that ease back in, in the December quarter accounts. And it's always important when you look at national accounts data, it's, it's like looking in the rearview mirror about six months. The last lot of national accounts were for December. And, um, and now we're in May, pretty close to the end, getting to the, towards the end of May. And, um, and so obviously we're operating already in an environment that has moved on from here. Uh, but you can see household expenditure was quite slow in terms of consumption. And also, where there has been growth, it's not been in what's traditionally defined as retail. You can see here some of the strongest growth. Purchase of vehicles was strong, and, and that was a, a sort of quarterly effect there. Uh, clothing and footwear was quite strong. But you look at some of the other areas, things that impact a lot of small businesses, furnishings, household equipment, recreation, hotels, cafes, restaurants. They were all areas that saw negative growth in the last quarter's um, national accounts. And retail trade has been falling. If you look at retail trade as a proportion of actual household consumption, the amount we spend that actually goes on what we think of as retail has been falling back over time. So we're actually seeing this sort of downward trend. We're spending more on what we have to spend on rather than traditional retail. So there's another important trend to keep in mind. The second top thing that businesses are telling us is that there's been a decrease in business. Now that's certainly one of the prime concerns that we're seeing for businesses at the moment. Uh, we're seeing lack of work, sales. It was a few years ago it was difficulties finding staff, the top concern of business, but once the GFC hit, really that turned to lack of work and sales, things like the economic climate and cash flow, the big issues uh, that are keeping small business operators awake at night. General economic outlook, something we didn't used to see a few years ago, but that's certainly uh, one of the top of mind things that's impacting on business confidence at the moment. So they're the big three. And, and certainly the economic climate, when you look, as we saw earlier, at that downward sloping GDP uh, is quite significant and impacting on businesses. You can see here, generally, 35% of businesses feel that the economy, as they said, is currently in a slowdown phase. We see about almost half of them thinking that it's standing still uh, and then the 35% slowdown. So there's not many businesses that are perceiving growth in the economy now and only one in five think it's going to be actually better in a year's time. So we've got these different expectations now of where the economy is at. When we saw the last Reserve Bank decision on interest rates, the key bit of data that really went into that last decision was inflation, the CPI data. This is a breakdown of the inflation data by category. Now, you, you'll recall the CPI, the last CPI was very weak. It was 0.1% growth and, and then 1.6% growth over the year. Very weak in terms of um, inflationary data. But what's interesting from a business perspective is if you look at the underlying components, and many businesses have been in a situation not able to increase prices for quite some time. You look at this and you can see the categories that we're having growth in, alcohol and tobacco, part of that there was a, an excise increase at the beginning of the year, tends to increase in the March quarter. Uh, housing, uh, we're seeing that sort of increase. Health was one of the big ones, uh, and that's really bolstered by changes to the pharmaceutical benefits scheme, which impact also in the March quarter at the beginning of the year. Uh, education, of course, increases in school fees, which impact at the beginning of the year. Uh, also transportation, um, where we see public sector transport, public transport user fees tend to increase at the beginning of the year. So a lot of the areas that, even in that week uh, number, the areas which were recording the growth were those areas which were fairly non-discretionary, 
fairly much things people have to spend on. And that means for the rest of the economy where people are, and your businesses are probably located, you're probably in the area that we're having to decrease prices just to keep business coming in the door. You can see most of those areas are the areas affecting the majority of small and medium businesses. And, and so th that really was one of the things in, in combination with the expenditure that we saw lead into that decision really for the 50 basis points uh, decrease in interest rates. Now we've seen the minutes coming out of that meeting now and one of the main factors is the Reserve Bank realised that the, the main uh, the bulk of it, not all of it, would be passed on. So we saw about 35 basis points on average passed on by banks. Now that's quite important from a small business perspective too because that's looking at the home mortgage uh, rates that tend to be passed on first when the banks release their headlines. But in terms of accessing finance, we're seeing that now on one of the more restrictive settings that we've seen uh, over the course of running the survey and looking at finance. Now, we've looked at finance now for um, since the GFC or in February 2010 in a slightly different way than we used to look at it. And we're trying to measure two things here. Uh, because most of the finance stats look at just whether businesses have accessed finance and if they're successful or not. What we're trying to see here is also on top of that how accommodative the perception of uh, finance is. So how, how easy or difficult a business is perceiving and so how does that influence their decision uh, to go on and get finance. You can see here 45% of businesses in the last quarter felt it was fairly difficult. Only 16% thought it was comparatively easy compared to what they generally find the finance situation. Uh, we saw that 17% um, had tried to access finance. It's also relatively low in the last quarter. And 64% um, had been successful. Uh, and, and that also is a bit below average that we'd see over the longer term as well. So we are seeing this difficulty for businesses accessing finance. That then flows into things such as capital expenditure uh, and, and innovation. On the good side, the, despite the fact that we've lowered our expectations for the economy downward quite significantly, businesses are still planning for growth and, and what they're doing in their businesses to sort of stimulate that growth. So we asked them at the beginning of the year and we asked them about every six months, what are you planning to do in your business? And one of the big things that we're seeing at the moment, and it's been the biggest growth certainly in the last year, is increasing digital presence. Uh, also introducing new products and services, that used to be the main thing that businesses were doing, but now really it's looking at how we access technology and increase our digital presence to try and drive what demand there is in the economy to our business. So we're seeing quite a lot of different strategies. Now in terms of your business, you might want to look down the list, it's, in, it's published in the report, uh, so you can actually take that and, and see if there's some things on that list that might be useful in your business that other businesses are looking at at the moment. And also if you're dealing in the business to business space, uh, there might be some things here that your customers might be looking at as well in terms of their business. So certainly businesses are planning for growth despite the economic conditions. When we look at digital, very much small and medium businesses are online. In fact, what we used to see over the longer term, if you look back, was small and medium businesses and business in general would adopt technology about two years ahead of the consumer market. Now that shifted radically a few years ago, two, three years ago when we saw uh, the mass adoption of things such as smartphones. We saw quite a shift in that. At the moment we see almost all businesses have computers, almost all have internet and broadband. About two-thirds have a website, and, and six and ten are likely to be selling online. So they're quite strong stats, actually. And we haven't seen huge upward shifts in those. They've obviously, computers, we've all had them for quite a long time. We still see a little bit of upward movement in things such as websites, specifically, and selling online. One of the important things, though, to really keep in context is how people are using them. And one of the myths I hear a lot uh, when I'm out talking to people is that somehow all of this stuff is in the future and uh, we're going to do some stuff in our business about the, some of the new technologies, but um, the, it's a sort of future thing. But it's not. It's actually a now thing. And it's been a now thing for a couple of years now. We've got 50% of the population searching the internet on a mobile phone device. Now, the problem from a business perspective is we found only 5% of businesses, small and medium businesses, have a website that's optimised for a mobile phone. So when somebody tries to look at your business on, on their mobile, they're probably not going to get a good user experience and they'll probably go somewhere else. So this is one of the things that people need to look at fairly quickly in terms of their business because this is where we're seeing the growth, actually, 
is in mobile phone usage of uh, the internet. And the other myth is that people are just mucking around and having fun on it. And certainly there's a bit of that, and they're looking for maps, and they're looking for information. And, and certainly they are using things like um, social media, and, but they're just as likely to be trying to, to use their phone to look for information on a product or service. They're possibly trying to look for your business. They might not be finding it, but they're trying to look for it. So it is important now uh, to make sure that you can be found and have a mobile optimised site for your business. It's not as hard or complicated as it sounds. We're actually spending a lot of money on technology. In New South Wales, small and medium businesses, you can see the numbers, $8,300 on hardware <clears throat> in the last year, 2800 on software, 7200 just maintaining all of the stuff, and $4,700 on websites. Now, hands up, who, who knows which is the only one of those four that we saw grow in the last year? Any guesses? Websites. It was the only area of technology expenditure that we saw move up and move up quite significantly in the last year. So this is where the focus for businesses is at the moment. All up, that's $24,000 per year on technology in small businesses. So it's quite a bit of money on average. But only 90% of businesses in New South Wales actually had a strategy, a digital business strategy. So we're spending a lot of money, but we're not maybe having a strategy surrounding that. So that is concerning. We haven't seen really much shift in those numbers over the last few years. When, when we do have a strategy, it's usually going to be internet, uh, internet and website but not so much social media and mobile, which is the areas that we're seeing growth in, in terms of consumer usage. So there's a bit of a mismatch between what consumers are doing and where businesses are spending the money. So it's important to keep in mind too where your customers are and what they're doing. The other thing I'd like to touch on at the moment today is innovation in small businesses. And you can see, uh, we've been looking at innovation for some time in terms of businesses. And there was a report, and it's probably available online, we were discussing last night, um, in terms of innovation we did some years ago. And in terms of innovation, it turned out there was quite a mismatch between how government perceived innovation and how businesses perceived innovation. So there were some fairly formal definitions for innovation. But then businesses were not seeing themselves as innovative because those definitions, definitions tended to be focused on, uh, on product in innovation, on manufacturing, a very strong manufacturing focus on those definitions. And for small businesses that were more likely to be service oriented, uh, those definitions didn't make as much sense for them and they didn't see themselves as innovative on that basis. So what we then asked businesses were, is, is, you know, did they feel that they were innovative and how did they define innovation in their business? And, and so we saw some shift at that time from that report on a, a bit of a change in how we think about innovation in business. So now when we look at innovation, we're looking at innovation as taking up and converting new ideas into commercial market success. So there's a few important concepts in there. New ideas, but innovation isn't just new ideas. It's also the conversion and using uh, the new idea and making it into something going forward. So it's taking the ideas and actually applying them. And, and so when we ask businesses to define themselves, you can see there's a bit of a curve here in terms of how businesses see their level of innovation. At the moment, you know, only 13% of SMEs feel that they're highly innovative. 33%, uh, about a third, one in three think that they're somewhat innovative. Uh, 36, so that's the biggest proportion, is saying that they're only slightly innovative. And about 15% said they're not really at all innovative, uh, and on another 2% which really weren't sure whether they're innovative or not. Now this data is coming from September last year, so at a point obviously on the economic cycle uh, that is quite weak, and we'll be looking at that in September again this year to, to sort of get a snapshot here, uh, get another year's data on that. But um, again, it's not just a one, uh, one type of innovation, but it's all. When we look at different locations, you can see that there's a whole spectrum in terms of where businesses sit uh, on a locational basis and how they think of their business in terms of innovation. And we're actually seeing New South Wales, regional New South Wales areas, in terms of the benchmark, fairly low. So it's a really important thing for this region to be driving innovation so strongly 
uh, it's certainly something that needs to be uh, really focused on here in this area. And, so, and this is why it's such important work that we're seeing done here in terms of innovation and driving the innovation message. And also it's important not to lock ourselves in to some of the definitions that might hamper us uh, in terms of how businesses think of innovation and how you know, what previous definitions might have defined innovation as. And it's important not to overlook an innovation. It's no less important if it's a service innovation or a process innovation for businesses. Uh, it's really the concept of we've taken something new, a new idea, and we've made it into something. And it's very important in terms uh, of, of the overall... Um, why am I this? I've gone backwards overall emphasis on the economic environment and innovation over the longer term we used to see before the GFC innovative firms tending to show higher sales and profitability. One of the things that we're seeing at the moment is those firms in those spaces having a really tough time. There's a number of reasons for this um, but one of the key ones is that innovative firms are more likely also to have global linkages also more likely to be in the medium sector. And, and this is a, a bit of research which perhaps shows that cut at the start of the GFC. We used to see medium business confidence significantly higher than small business confidence. But at the time of the GFC, that really crunched in. And we're not seeing the gap. We're seeing the gap basically less than half now. Some quarters, it's even the other way around. Uh, and when we looked at the key reason behind this, it was mainly to do with global linkages because the firms at the moment that have international exposure have been the firms that are seeing the GFC hit hardest, seeing the exchange rate changes hit their business hardest in terms of being able to drive exports. Uh, and so a lot of those things are hitting that area even more so. So it is a very big challenge for innovative firms and for firms to innovate at the moment. Uh, it's something that needs to be really focused on, so it is good to see and it's really needed uh, the work that is being done here at the moment in terms of promoting the importance of innovation, but also maybe how we think about innovation in businesses. One of the reasons why that is important is because we see this very strong link then between the capital investment that's needed and the investment that's needed for innovation and the link I talked about earlier with finance. You can see it basically follows almost lockstep between the accessibility of finance and, and how we've gone in then being able to invest capital in our businesses to grow moving forward and to do things and finance things like innovation. And so looking at that data, really, until we get some improvement in the economic conditions, it's going to be very hard yards uh, for firms that are trying to go out there and be innovative at the moment. Um, even more reason to be looking at that. As I mentioned, we've got a few reports coming out soon. Uh, we've got our second yellow social media report coming out in just over a week now, about a week and a half. Uh, we started this report last year looking at social media because it was hard for businesses to access uh, objective data on social media. So we collected the data, it's got consumer, small, medium and large businesses. So you can see how different businesses focus on, on some of the new and growing areas of, of digital at the moment in social media. It's one of those things where we're seeing quite a mature consumer market compared to a business market again that is actually at the moment trying to catch up to where consumers are with social media. So you'll be able to get a lot of stats out of there in terms of what you might be looking at in your, in an appropriate social media strategy for your business. The next business index on the economy and economic conditions for small business and the big issues there will be out in the 5th of June. And then in July we'll be having our next technology report, which will see how we've tracked in some of those digital indicators that I was mentioning earlier. And so hopefully I've kept fairly much to time. And um, back to you. Oh, and um, all of our reports are online available at our website, so you can easily access them from the front page if you want any. <laughs>